Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to have you back with us today. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we start our program. I hope that some of you have had a chance to look at our new website. It's up and running, chooseunitedfordemocracy.org. You can access all of our past virtual programs on the website, and you can also register for any upcoming programs via the website. So it's probably your easiest way to get the information you want from us and to be able to register. Uh, one feature on the website are links to organizations involved uh, in working on issues relevant to our judge mission. So if you want to go to that part of the website and suggest other nonpartisan organizations to include, please send us an email either by replying to one of our emails or via the website. You can send a, a comment to us on the website. Um, but take a look at it. Many of the organizations we're referring to uh, you to are from people who have spoken at one of our programs. So I think you'll find them very uh, accessible and, and uh, very relevant to what we've been talking about. We are very excited to announce that Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist Carl Bernstein will be speaking on September 30th. You can sign up via the website. And also we have some exciting news. We're not gonna tell you all the details today, but save the date of November 1st, which is two nights before election day. We will be presenting a special two hour rotating panel of experts to analyze the impending election. That will be on Sunday, November 1st from five to seven. Thank you all for your wonderful notes and checks. They're very appreciated. And now you can donate directly from our website um, with credit cards. So thank you to all of our donors. Thank you to our co-sponsors, Valley Beth Shalom, Temple Israel of Hollywood, Ikar, Stephen Wise Temple, The Forward, Jewish Center for Justice, and we have two new partners this week, Temple Beth Am and the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust. So welcome to our new sponsors, and thank you to all the members of all of the synagogues and organizations. This series is a joint venture between Judge, that's Jews United, and Community Advocates, Inc., on behalf of judges' leadership, Zev Yaroslavsky, Mel Levine, Rabbi Ken Chazen, Caroline Kelly, and uh, David Lehrer and myself, we are thrilled to be able to present this truly extraordinary series. And speaking of community advocates and David Lehrer, with whom I am sharing the screen tonight and lots of work that goes into the series, here's the great David Lehrer. Thank you, Janice. On behalf of community advocates, I'm pleased to join and welcome you once again to our virtual town hall. Our Wednesday evening encounters keep expanding in popularity. Tonight, we have over 3,000 registrants, a new record for us. Our extraordinary lineup of speakers gets more special every week. This week, we enlisted Alex Padilla, the Secretary of State of California, who will give us the facts on election fraud, absentee ballots, and protecting the right to vote. In 2016, there were nearly 20 million registered voters in California, and there were precious few hiccups. So far in 2020, we have over 15 million registered, nearly double the number of registered voters of New York, the next highest state. Padilla, Padilla knows about high stakes elections. He will join us on September, September 16th in conversation with Zev Yaroslavsky, our former city councilman and county supervisor and a member of the judge executive committee. Tonight we have with us one of the intellectual pillars of American conservatism, Bill Crystal. He'll be in dialogue with one of our favorite interviewers, the wonderful Pat Morrison, who will introduce him. Pat is a longtime Los Angeles Times writer and columnist who has a share of two Pulitzer Prizes. Her broadcasting work on radio and TV has won six Emmys and 11 Golden Mics. Her book about the LA River was a bestseller, and she was the first woman in nearly 25 years to be honored with the LA Press Club's Lifetime Achievement Award. And to confirm her uniqueness, Pink's, the legendary hot dog Hollywood hot dog stand named its veggie dog after Pat. She's worked with this town hall, at, hall effort for several years and is a repeat moderator in this virtual series. Pat? David, thank you so much. I'm always uh, happy to work with you and your organizations. You've been such a light in this community for so long and uh, this series is yet more proof of that. So you have been reading and hearing from and about Bill Crystal for a very long time. Both of his parents were conservative intellectuals. He himself founded the Weekly Standard, co-founded uh, think tanks and organizations like the Project for the New American Century, served on the board of the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research, worked on Daniel Patrick Moynihan's Senate campaign, worked as chief of staff in the White House for Dan Quayle and other jobs, roles within earlier Republic administ Republican administrations. And um, now, however, 
intellectual conservatism means something else altogether because when Donald Trump was running for president 2015, 2016, Bill Kristol joined and led the ranks of the never Trumpers. The intellectual nature of conservatism has been abandoned. Maybe even the label itself has been abandoned in the era of Trump, where we have a party that's about the person who heads it rather than the principles of the party. So uh, we'll be uh, getting your questions a little bit later after I talk to Bill Kristol and after Bill Kristol has a few things to say for himself about how he's viewing this administration, how the American role in this country and in the world, the role of political parties in this country has evolved and changed. And whether as the title of this presentation suggests there's any going back, there's any recovering soul of America. Bill Kristol, thanks so much. No, thanks, Pat. It's good to be with you. It's good to be with David and Janice and all of you. Uh, I look forward to our conversation. I'll just maybe say a word. I Actually, I think I have a few relatives on this call, and my wife has a few relatives on this call, but I, I won't mention them so they can have deniability or whatever, whatever I say. Um, let me just make two points to kind of maybe just to set the framework. Uh, I was very ho against uh, hostile to Donald Trump, uh, alarmed by his emergence. Did not expect him to be the Republican nominee. That was a surprise. Was worried that he would win the general election once he was the nominee. Uh, didn't think he would, but I thought he had a real a chance, unfortunately. And of course, he did win. And I think I was right to be alarmed. I mean, I, I think I had a sense of the power of the presidency. And we've had demagogues before in America. Uh, we've had extremists who were nominated by parties in America. The demagogues tended to be senators or governors or radio hosts or whatever and had some, did some damage but it's, they didn't become president. And the extremists didn't become president, typically. Uh, and now we have one as president. And I do think maybe this came from working in the White House in the George H.W. Bush administration. I think I had a sense of how much damage a president can do if he's unmoored by any real attachment to traditional norms or, 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 or procedures or even the law. Um, it's been a little worse than I expected because I expected him to be constrained, and he was somewhat constrained in the first year or two uh, by various establishment figures, various people he appointed. Uh, they're mostly gone, and I think we're in a, you know, he's done real damage. Uh, what happens, assuming he loses, uh, after he leaves, how much of that damage is lasting uh, is, of course, one of the fundamental questions that it's very hard to predict really hard to predict because we just haven't really been through this before. We don't have a kind of case study quite to, to compare this to. Um, so I think it's a big deal, I guess is the way I would put it. People who think Trump is a hiccup, it just happened, we can just go back to the way it was, everyone will forget about him, the Republican Party will be what it was, our politics will be what it was. I'm worried that, that I wish actually that were the case in, 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 in most respects, but I'm worried that it's not. Second point, uh, even more briefly, uh, I do think I've taken some comfort, i put it this way, from the strength of our institutions. This is America, we've been around for a while. We have an awfully well-developed uh, set of institutions. We have federalism, which is a good thing. So state and local governments have power. We have separation of powers. The president, the executive doesn't have all the power. Uh, we have civil society, business, churches, universities, media. There's an awful lot here to block anyone from uh, certainly taking all the power, being truly author successfully authoritarian, and even block a lot of the policies and compensate for some of the damage for that matter. Uh, we're not Hungary, we're not Argentina, we're not gonna fall apart because we have one uh, demagogic and irresponsible president for four years. Uh, I think a lot of the institutions have performed well. It's been a very interesting study really, I think from political scientists and sociologists, sociologists and others, historians, to see you know, which ones have sort of done, been, turned out to be uh, as strong or maybe stronger than we thought. Others, I think, weaker than we thought. For me, the, the ones that have been most disappointing and worrisome are Congress, um, but relatedly, really, the Republican Party, and more fundamentally, the Republican Party, because the Republican Party do, uh, controlled both houses of Congress for the first two years of the Trump presidency, obviously, and now controls the Senate. It's been a that for me has been the biggest surprise. Not much about Trump's behavior surprised me. The total collapse and capitulation of the Republican Party and in large parts of the conservative movement have surprised me. That has made the damage worse. Um, and it does raise the question of what happens afterwards with the Republican Party. It would it'd be good for this country to have two 
pretty responsible, pretty centrist, you might say, parties uh, who can alternate power in a kind of reasonably healthy way. I think that's kind of the story of America over the, the past century or so, most of the time at least, and, and, and really in an important way compared to other countries. I'm less confident that we end up out of this with two responsible parties, and that could just change the whole dynamic of American politics. So I think it's one of the big questions um, uh, hanging over us as we look past Donald Trump. Un unmute yourself, Pat. Yeah, you need to unmute. Sorry, thank you. Sorry. Um, would you talk about the, the Lincoln Project, which has been putting up some zinger 30 second, one minute ads, running them on Fox to get under Trump's skin? In fact, saying things that I don't think Democrats could get away with saying. These are people like you who saw a danger coming on the horizon and now see that it is a fully fledged and manifested risk uh, to the country. So where is, is, in a larger sense, where is the audience, where are the voters who can yet be swayed on Donald Trump? They're not going to be his loyalists. That's the 30, 35%. But where is the audience for these ads for the kind of campaign that Democrats and Republicans like you should be out there running and talking about? So on the electorate, it's become a big thing among political scientists how many fewer swing voters there are fewer ticket splitters, fewer voters who change their mind from election to election than there were 30 or 40 years ago. And that's clearly true if you just look at the numbers. There used to be big swings from one election to another. Uh, the last several, really since the end of the Cold War, there have been rather smaller swings in percentages of the electorate. Having said that, you can still get a pretty big change. And from 2016 to 2018, 2018 is an off-year election, so it's not entirely comparable, but it was a high turnout off-year election. Uh, in 2016, if you just take all the House races, leave aside Trump, take the House races, just add up all the votes, 435 districts. Republicans, I think, won by half a percentage point. They have a slight edge in the House. Um, in 2018, Dem there were more Democrats won the national vote by about nine percentage points. That's a big swing. Some of it is people changing their minds. Some of it is Democrats coming out to vote who had stayed home in 2016. Some of it is Republicans staying home. So there are swing voters. Uh, there are different categories of swing voters. They can get complicated, but there are swing voters. So there are two major, I'd say, never Trump Republican groups or ex-Republican groups, Republican groups, Republican leaning groups uh, in doing things today. There are a lot of you know, smaller groups that are doing good work too, so I don't mean to neglect them. One is the Lincoln Project. They're friends of mine. They do these glitzy ads, which are good and which uh, get in Trump's head. And I think, you know, I think reinforce among some Republicans, that it's okay to be against Donald Trump. And also they make some arguments that Democrats, for their own reasons, don't want to particularly focus on making. And I think that's, that's a reasonable division of labor. Republicans, uh, the Lincoln Project isn't really trying to make a case for anyone particularly. Obviously, they're, they want people to vote for Joe Biden, but it's not their job as a party, the way it is for the Democrats, to, uh, you know, to really make that their, made, to, to, to praise Joe Biden, uh, to be careful about criticism, lest it be backlash against Joe Biden. So in a way, the Lincoln Project and the group I'm associated with, Republican Voters Against Trump, that I'm one of the directors of, we can be a little more uninhibited. You know, if there's a backlash against us, so what, we're not on the ballot. Our group, Republican Voters Against Trump, and some people may have seen some of these ads, took a different complementary approach to the Lincoln Project, we found Republicans, we, well, let me back up. We, we, we set up three years ago, it was Defending Democracy Together, and we had one failed effort after another. We had Republicans for the rule of law. We defended Mueller, which Bob Mueller, which was a good right thing to do. The Mueller report ended up not producing uh, impeachment of Donald Trump. He then was impeached. We then spent a huge amount of time trying to get some Republicans in Congress to vote for impeachment or conviction. There was one, Mitt Romney, who did it. We spent a lot of time trying to get Republicans to run against uh, Trump mm -hmm. in the Republican primaries. We thought that was important to try to save the party from Trump or at least show a challenge. Uh, two or three, three, two really uh, stepped up and tried, but they weren't major figures and they didn't have much effect. So it was, it's been pretty frustrating two or three years for a lot of us. But we then moved on once it was clear it was going to be Trump. Uh, we actually did a little bit to try to help Biden in the, in the Democratic primary by urging in states where you can cross over urging independents and Republicans to vote for what we would consider a more electable Democrat and a 
Democrat closer to our views, obviously, which would be Biden by contrast with Sanders, certainly. Then so, in the general election, what we've done is managed to get an awful lot of Republicans from around the country to send in videos, and you may have seen some of them, on their cell phones about why they're not voting for Trump in 2016. Mm -hmm. Some of them didn't vote for him in 2020. Some of them didn't vote for him in 2016. Uh, some of them stayed home in 2016. But a lot of them voted for Trump. They were reluctant Trump supporters. They had qualms. They didn't like him much, but they had problems with Hillary Clinton. They cared about certain issues. They were very traditional. They've been Republicans for 20, 30, 40 years. So they kind of, they pulled the lever. And now there are, you know, there are about 500 of, the, of them now on our website, Republican Voters Against Trump. Uh, we promote them a lot on Facebook and Twitter and so forth. We do some ads with them in, in key swing states. So you won't see them in California, but in other states they're seeing them. And, um, and these are really, I found them, they've been, I, well, I find them moving actually. These are people who say, you know, I, I thought he might be better. I thought he might step up to the occasion. I thought the Republicans in Congress could shape him. And now it turned out I was wrong. I regret my vote, a lot of them say, uh, and I, we can't have another four years of this. Right. I think it's an effective um, message. And the social science research shows that, uh, you know, if you're a voter out there in Michigan or in Florida, and you, you, know, you reluctantly voted for Trump in 2016, or maybe you sat it out, and now you're, you've always been Republican, you have your issues with Biden and the Democrats, you're not sure. But one of the most effective messengers to that voter is someone like him or her. It's not me, it's not Steve Schmidt, it's not someone who's been attacking Trump for five years. It's someone who says, you know, I also thought we should give the guy a chance. I thought it might work out, but I was wrong and it's okay to change your mind. And that's been um, very much our focus at Republican Voters Against Trump. We have a lot of questions to get to, so if we can, uh, you know how people are, you know, we're going to go uh, speed answering through here. And, and I think we talked earlier about um, what's going on in Portland, and I'm just wondering, Given his transgressions, the firing of inspectors general, the violation of the emoluments clause, the um, the interim appointments, the the temporary appointments for cabinet, what what is he capable of in the next 100 days? To you know, shutting down the streets on election day to keep people from getting in, into the polls. This is there seems to be nothing that's beyond this man. It's very worrisome. A lot of the checks that were there within the government don't exist. Some do. I think the Defense Department. Show, realized uh, it went to this, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Secretary of Defense realized they went too far when they escorted him across Lafayette Square. And they've made pretty clear that they don't want to get trapped into that again. Um, but Trump re realized that kind of through oversight, I would say through neglect, the Department of Homeland Security has been allowed to accumulate all these law enforcement quasi police forces, uh, which it turns out the law is kind of ambiguous about, and they can be deployed allegedly to help protect federal buildings, but then they can do other things. So that's what's worrisome about, I mean, apart from what's happening in Portland, that's what's worrisome as a, about Portland as a kind of predicate for other things. I'm very worried about the next three and a half months. I'm worried about the day, weeks, days, and weeks, and a couple of months after election day, too. I mean, this is where the power of the federal government, he has a lot of authority he can use. Now, I do think there's a lot of professionalism in the civil service and among some political appointees, which will check him in different ways, make it a little harder. But you think of foreign powers intervening, maybe his welcoming those interventions. I mean, think of it this way, the Ukraine scandal for which he was impeached. Literally everyone who stopped him from doing what he wanted to do in Ukraine and manufacture evidence in effect against Joe Biden is gone now. They've left the government, they've been fired, they've been forced out. The inspector generals, as you, inspectors general, as you say, are gone. The whistleblower, I'm not sure we don't know if, you know if he or she's still there. Um, so it's worrisome. I, I think people are not actually, honestly, kind of alarmed enough about what his, um, it's not that the military is gonna suddenly take over our streets. I mean, the military is pretty well disciplined, but the degree to which he can at least create incidents, uh, uh, mis obviously there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation. But again, it's one thing just to have misinformation, disinformation. It's something to have the federal government, some parts of it at least in the White House, helping in that. And I think that's something people need to be very alert about and uh, you know, blow, sound the warnings about uh, uh, ahead of time and then as it happens over the next weeks and months. Uh, you talk about your faith in the institutions of democracy, and yet some people might give you some pushback on that. Certainly the Republicans in the Senate have been supine in so many things and have made some kind of deal with the devil that if we get our judges, you can do anything you want. And, and that 
fairly to some way of thinking fragile vessel of John Roberts on the Supreme Court may be the one who's making sure that first the reputation of the court and then the institutions of democracy are protected in so far as it's possible. Look, I, I totally agree. The collapse of the Republican Party for me is the most disastrous thing that's happened. Um, what if you thought of it before, but I mean, it, it just is an kind of analytical matter in terms of Trump being able to get away with things that uh, a, a, in the old days, even a House of Congress, the Senate, controlled by his own party, would not have permitted, just out of institutional kind of pride and and a sense that it's not appropriate. That's really been just terrible. I do think it's interesting you mentioned the Chief Justice. I, I think it, it was interesting in that last week of the term that Roberts went out of it, I think managed to get Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, and I think they may have wanted to be part of this. I mean, they were resolving a case on the merits, I'm sure, but I think it was important that they had a, a two seven to two decisions where they basically made clear they wouldn't go along with anything Trump wanted. I think that was a bit of a signal that the courts are not going to be quite as pliant as maybe Trump would have hoped. But again, you never know. And uh, I, I agree, though, that the Republicans and, and Congress, and it's, it's an overlapping you know, set there, that's been the greatest uh, both disappointment, but really the most dangerous aspect. And you have to ask, I mean, what if Trump tries, it's election night, Trump's a little bit ahead, because but the later, but for, you know, California, you always get these votes coming in for a week. The later votes are going to be more democratic. They often are, actually, in, in some of these mail-in states. Uh, and, uh, you know, Trump starts saying it's over. It's, all these other votes are illegitimate. They're, it's a rigged system. They're, 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 they're cheating. They're stealing. Once I would have said, well, he could say that. But A, the Justice Department's not going to back him up. He's not going to be able to really get much support from within his own government. Even Bob Barr? Yeah, well, now I wouldn't say that anymore because oh. I'm very worried by what Barr has been able to do. And B, no, sorry, you're right. I and mean, that's exactly the point. And B, I would have once said, you know, Bob Dole as a Senate Majority Leader or Bill Frist as a Senate Majority Leader, they're not going to just let Trump throw our whole electoral system into total disarray and, and delegitimize the election results. I hope that would be true of Mitch McConnell and senior Republicans in the Senate, but you, you certainly can't be confident. No matter when Trump leaves, um, that will not be the end of Trumpism. You see candidates from QAnon who are in a position to get elected to Congress now. So what, what fragrant legacy um, does he leave behind besides packing the courts, besides trying to expunge whole departments of government from scientists and civil servants who are disinterested in politics and and what what does he do to the republicans in in specific and to the these institutions in general how the shape that he leaves them in is just an, an intolerable mess i would think no look i think that's the huge question i think some of them can be fixed it will take a while but you know obviously responsible governance can just like a better a new CEO comes in at a company or to it at any civil institution, you can fix one that's been run into the ground to some degree. But there's a price to be paid. Look at the pandemic. I mean, there's a real world price to be paid from having Trump personally up there, but then a bunch of, in some of these uh, organizations of government, not the most able people uh, uh, running them and other people who are just catering to Trump in a way that's totally irresponsible and and then pressuring governors to do things and they're also being so irresponsible and they're more irresponsible because of Trump, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's just, there's a real price to be paid. How much damage, the, the lingering damage, I think the executive branch will can be fixed. I mean, you can get the scientists back in, you can reestablish norms in the Justice Department, you can begin to pass new legislation to curb some things that were allowed to kind of grow because people didn't quite see the abuse maybe and they didn't see the opportunity for abuse like DHS and- Right, Portland. you couldn't so, imagine so. that this would happen. Yes, I think that will happen. That part I think can be fixed. Republican Party, that's more worrisome. And as you say, what, what's it gonna, what are the candidates who run in 2022 gonna look like? Maybe there'll be a reversion back to sort of more responsible conservatism. Maybe they'll just still be trying to out Trump each other and Trump's not going away and Trump's family's not going away and Trumpism isn't going away. And, and the thing that scares me the most is once you unleash, I think this is true in life, in one's personal life almost too, as well as the life of the nation. Once you unleash a politics, a psychology almost, of resentment and victimization and fanning the flames of bigotry and hatred, it's hard to put it back. And, and that's for me, one of the great damages that Trump has done. And again, we've had plenty of demagogues and plenty of you know bigoted people in American public life, but to have a president fanning those flames for four years just has a, a much greater effect 
than a governor in one state or a senator from another state. Uh, as a Republican, he's really not much of one. He's entirely opportunistic. There, there seem to be no real principles he would adhere to except saving and enhancing his own skin. So, so then what legacy then to explore that a little more is left from that? What do you pick up the pieces of if there is no Donald Trump to rally around anymore? Yeah, so maybe that's kind of a, a good thing that, you know, it, it's a cult of personality and when the, often in history, and this is true in the history of religions and the history of nations and, and so social movements, when the, when the personality around whom the cult is organized uh, leaves, um, the cult kind of falls apart and that could happen. But again, I worry about what's been unleashed. Um, I worry about what's been eroded. And some of these things are harder to fix. I, 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 you know, the Republican Party had its flaws and wasn't ever, you know, the, maybe as great as some of us hoped it would be. But, you know, having a responsible view of American international leadership, having a, a reasonable commitment to the rule of law, a different version of it than Democrats preferred, perhaps. But uh, those things, I, I worry about whether those come back. Again, once demagoguery has been sort of normalized and legitimized, it, it's uh, it, it, it's not so clear that it won't work in 2022 or 2024. Maybe it won't. That's a huge challenge, I think. Uh, you've seen how politics is done. You've seen how governance is done. And I'm wondering how, as we see the, the twin crises of COVID and then the in a way, the, the crisis that Trump has created in the streets by saying that there is a problem when and, and generating one himself. Um, where is his Achilles heel? Is, are people going to find, hey, my neighbor had COVID, my uncle had COVID, and the government didn't do anything about it? Is that the kind of thing that ends up defeating a politician rather than his or her own particular policies? Yeah, sometimes. Well, yeah, another way of saying it is that reality is what matters, I think, ultimately, usually. And he, he had all kinds of irresponsible policies and all kinds of really despicable, in my view, uh, actions and behavior. But a lot of people were able to rationalize it. I don't like it much, you know, it's unfortunate. But you know what? The economy's good. The country's kind of at peace. People like me might scream and yell about how damaging his foreign policies are to a, the international liberal order, which has kept us at peace and prosperous for 70 years, mostly, and, and in a pretty impressive way in terms of the world. Um, can't take it for granted, as the first half of the 20th century shows. But I could say that till I'm blue in the face, and if people look around and they don't see everything just falling apart, they don't quite believe you. It's easy to rationalize things when things are okay. Uh, you know, sort of like saying, well, this guy's not doing a good job running the company. Well, I don't know. Sales look like what they always were. Profits are okay. You know, it, 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 there's not, you know, the warehouse isn't burning down. So what's the problem? Well, I do think here the pandemic has just brought out the utter failure of, of being at all responsible or serious about governance. Um, it's funny, we do these, all these focus groups for our Republican voters against Trump. I'd say some voters are, some people have reacted to different things, but I'd say the competence issue, just in terms of the pandemic, people kind of say, okay, this is serious. He's not up to it. And even if I voted for him four years ago, even if I sort of still think maybe we needed to shake things up, we can't have another four years of it. You hear that a lot. And the other thing you hear a lot, and not to be gender, you know, less specific or stereotypical, but I say this is more from women in, in focus groups, is the divisiveness. It's too much. I don't like people will say, I don't necessarily even agree with taking all the monuments down. I certainly don't think we should have violence. And you know, I, some of that stuff goes too far for me, but we could not have a president, president of the United States fanning the flames the way he does just day after day, week after week. And what would another four years look like? People, if again, it's one thing for people to look backwards and sort of rationalize a vote or supporting him for a couple of years as president. It's another thing to say another four years will be fine. And I think it's getting, it's gotten very hard to say that. And I think that's really what's moved the five, six, seven percent of the, of the electorate that has moved in the last three, four, five months from being reluctantly for Trump to now, I would say, reluctantly for Biden. So then none of this happens in a vacuum. What kind of campaign does Joe Biden have to run, especially given the constraints on campaigning anyway with the conventions and then on into November? 
I mean, the conventional view, which I think is right, basically, is that incumbent re-elections are mostly about the incumbent. It's a referendum. Do you want four more years of this person? I've always thought, even when Trump was doing pretty well a year ago, that the four more years question would hurt Trump. It's one thing to take a certain relish if you're on the right. He's you know, showing those liberals that he's, I don't like my liberal mayor, and Trump is right that he should crack down on, I don't know, it should be, should, shouldn't be a sanctuary city, whatever, you know, all these issues. And they can always find something to like, maybe, in what Trump is doing and, and block out some of the other stuff. Uh, that gets harder, I think, when you say, but do you really want four more years of this? So I think the four more years issue the income is key, and, and that's really more about Trump than Biden. I, honestly, I do think the Democrats were wise uh, to, to nominate someone who is acceptable to a broad spectrum of the Democratic Party and to an awful lot of independents and, and some chunk of Republicans. Um, I think he's run a, a good campaign so far. I mean, people can make fun of him and say he's you know, sitting in the basement and all, but what he has said on key issues has been responsible. He, he, is, he has kept the left wing of the Democratic Party mostly on board by saying, look, I do want to change fundamental things. I want to be aggressive on climate change and so forth. But he's also said to people like more of the Republican voters against Trump type, but also a lot of moderate Democrats, um, that, you know, I, I'm going to respect people. I'm going to treat people with decency. I talked to a Democrat who's not working on the Biden campaign, but is close to a lot of those people the other day, quite a senior Democrat. And he said, you just, you know, for us in Washington, we're in these policy things and of where should Biden, what exactly should you do about the Green New Deal? And what about this? And what about that? A ton of people It just, could we just have someone who does not divide the country, who unites the country, who's a decent human being, who's going to do his best, is going to appoint serious people, isn't going to have the kind of farce you see at the White House every day. I do think that that respect Biden turns out to be a very good contrast with Trump. This is a hypothetical, but you wonder if impeachment had happened months after it actually did, you know, after the news coming out about the Russian bounty on American and British soldiers in Afghanistan, after so many of these scandals upon scandals, in addition to, to the Ukraine matter, um, would it have made any difference to these, these recalcitrant Republicans who seem to be willing to go down with the good ship, bad ship Trump? I don't know, honestly, and I, I would hope it might have but i've got to say look at them today you know for all the slight maneuvering they're doing away they're not really breaking with trump i mean here's the fundamental question should he be president for the next four years and right now as i understand it except for mitt romney and maybe one or two others in the senate and i think really liz cheney republican their answer is yes even liz cheney whom i know and who i think is much has huge private reservations about trump and is now fighting with the trump but the most fervent Trump supporters in the House, she always quickly says, but of course we can't have Biden, so I'm supporting Trump. And all the governors, with the exception, I guess, of Larry Hogan in Maryland and, and uh, Charlie Baker in Massachusetts, I think I was all the Republican governors, maybe one or two other exceptions, are for Trump. So I, I, it makes the, the, the tribalism, the partisanship is so deep, and that's a problem that obviously has grown up over the decades, uh, that they just turn out to be, I don't know, they've created this image of what Biden's going to do, which is honestly ludicrous in my, in my opinion. Uh, but they just need rationalizations to, it's just so much easier, I guess, to stick with Trump. I, I, I am, I, that part surprises me. I don't fully understand that even psychologically, honestly. Uh, oh, you mean to justify? Yeah, the power, of, that, the power of sort of, of rationalization. People I've known yeah. 30 years who are intelligent people, thoughtful people, well-educated. And, you know, just five years ago, if you had read them a list of the things Donald Trump has done in the last week, they would say, well, you can't have a man like that as president. That's just out of the question. I mean, it's just not even a close call. Now it's, oh, well, look, that stuff's not so great, but what about this? And Biden might do that. And Oh, the what about isms. Yeah. Um, we're going to go to our audience questions in a minute, but Trump did not come out of nowhere. Right. There was something already there that allowed him to happen. And it wasn't just the game show, television show host thing that did it. What was it? Was it the Tea Party in 2010 that sought to delegitimize President Obama? I mean, you were a big fan of Sarah Palin's, a promoter of Sarah Palin's. I still remember the piece in the New Yorker about that. So what, what was the soil that was tilled that allowed these Cadmus dragon's teeth that we see now gobbling us up to get into our metaphor. Uh, what what happened? What made Trump possible? I mean, look, both major parties in America have huge, you know, are huge coalitions with a lot of disagreeable, disreputable parts 
to them, I would say. And then other parts that are mis just a little bit misled or overly excited or whatever, or sometimes kind of ignorant of things. Um, I do think on the Republican side, there was more latent bigotry, uh, just to kind of vic self uh, victimization, uh, just a kind of burning, resent uh, not burning, I mean, resentment that was burning under the surface that kind of erupted with Trump. I mean, I didn't quite see it. I, I, I take, you know, I'm happy to take some responsibility for that. And, and um, I mean, one reason I, I was for Joe Lieberman in 2008 as McCain's VP, but when it became clear they weren't going to do that, I thought, well, take a gamble on Palin. But I would say one of the reasons, just to take a second on that, is I thought, you know what, there's kind of a populist wave coming. And maybe if you put someone like Palin on the ticket, she was not an unpopular governor of Alaska. She wasn't bigoted or anything like that. She was pro-immigration. She was where McCain was on the issues, really. That's why, you know, he picked her and she ran as a McCain, loyal, loyal McCain uh, number two. She turned out not to be up to it in all kinds of ways. And that was just, I didn't know her well, but that was a miscalculation about her quality, honestly. But it wasn't crazy to say, let's kind of co-opt some of the populist instincts. You need to do that in a huge country like ours. And there were policies that failed and there were more people suffering in middle America than some of us realized. And all, all those are, are fair. Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot going on, as you say, in the soil that produced this. Um, but I wouldn't also minimize, I mean, you know, the party nominated uh, McCain and nominated Romney. I mean, it, who, it wasn't obvious it was, was gonna happen. And some of it is just the contingency of history. You know, if Trump had decided not to run, Republicans probably would have nominated someone who would have looked like a kind of normal Republican nominee, he would have run a normal race against Hillary Clinton, and we wouldn't be having this conversation. So I, I, do, th I do think the celebrity thing, I'd say just one word on that, that I underestimated because I never watched his TV show, and I didn't really take it seriously, and I knew that it was a produced show, you know, so that it wasn't like he wasn't really making business decisions. They were creating little dramas each week for an hour. The number of people, I went to a couple of Trump rallies in 2015, 16 to see what it was like. Kind of wasn't always welcomed with open arms, but, but people were polite mostly and, you know, and asked me why I was hostile to Trump. And I tried to explain and I said, why are you for him? And well, he's really a good businessman. I said, really? I mean, all the bankruptcies and Trump University and the fraud. No, but I've seen those, that show on TV and he really is good. He's decisive, but he's also got a sense of humor and he, you know, has different people around him. It was a very skillfully done show, mm. I guess. I, I watched, then I went back home I, on YouTube. I watched some segments just to sort of see what it was like, you know, and it, it conveyed a certain image of him that unfortunately people tended to, tended to want to believe. They bought, they bought into. And, uh, well, um, as I mean, I'll put it this way, Pat Buchanan ran in 92. I was very strongly against him. I was happy when he left the party. Rand Paul, there's always been a streak of this, of course, on the Republican conservative side of McCarthyism, a big Look at Ross Perot as a man of that popular. Perot's a little crazy, not bigoted, I wouldn't say, but anyways, it's always been all that around. But one of the big stories was that was kind of kept in check, you know, they didn't yeah. nomination, right? They were like 15, 20% of the vote. There were a couple of wacky people in Congress, but basically most of the people were kind of mainstream. And that just collapsed. Uh, and as you said, the fact that it collapsed so thoroughly does show that it was a little more rotten than, than unfortunately than some of us thought. Well, my shortcoming was that the only thing I knew about Donald Trump is what I read in Spy Magazine. So <laughs> so let's take one of our, our, our questions, um, which is about both the census and the election and Donald Trump's efforts to delegitimize both of those institutions and the impact that will have. Yeah, the census, I'm not sure, because I think if Biden wins, he can probably fix some of that. But um, the election, I, I am, I take that very seriously. People think he's just like a lunatic about the mail voting and the data doesn't support him. So why is he saying it? He's saying it so that he can, if it's at all close, uh, he can claim it was stolen and at least take a shot at staying in office by getting friendly governors and others to kind of stop the counting or, you know, do various things that would, would uh, tip it to him in a, in a close election. So I, um, he's totally irresponsible. And this is a case where in both parties, people have given up on elections, Nixon in 60, Gore in 2000, where they actually had a plausible claim that it wasn't quite fair, but that, yeah. you know, you can't, in a democracy, you, you, you can't at some point, you have to stop and you have to let the system go on for the sake of the country. There's not an ounce of that in Trump. Uh, the question that pops up again and again is we saw with the pardon of Richard Nixon um, that 
it was go in peace and and you know as, as ford said our long national nightmare is over but the question from bill and several others assuming biden wins should the government go after trump legally and their enablers for any criminal actions we see that we, we would expect that he would be paving the streets with pardons on his way out if that were to be the case but uh, I don't think he can pardon himself, but but is it time for some kind of truth and rec reconciliation uh, reckoning um, when you have violations this flagrant from the top down? Yeah, I think he will try to pardon himself, and he'll say it's unclear in law, and and then let them you know try to test it. Um, I, I'm of two minds of that, as I suppose most thoughtful people are. On the one hand, you hate to see people get away with things. Um, not just Trump, but all others throughout the government, the degree to which the normal ethics rules have just collapsed is really astonishing. On the other hand, it is one of the things of a healthy and stable democracy usually is you sort of let the people who've lost go in peace. You don't spend a lot of time prosecuting you know, the previous people who were in there. That's why we were all so offended by lock her up and all that. It's so irresponsible for Trump to be saying for the first two years of his presidency, why isn't anyone prosecuting Hillary Clinton? It's so inappropriate, you know? And I can make a case from the point of view of national comedy, just as with Ford pardoning Nixon, that you just maybe have to kind of move on in a lot of these cases. Now that we have a federal system, the state of New York will have something to say about this and so forth. And I, I guess I would say if I were Biden, I would tell the Justice Department, you do your job. I don't even want to know about it. I would really try that attorney general pick is a very important pick. It should be someone of real stature, a former judge or someone not a partisan who, because that's a place where you don't want, you, you, you know, you, you don't want Americans to think, okay, now we have a country where basically whoever becomes president puts his cronies in and prosecutes everyone else from the other party. Not that, I mean, Trump is guilty of that to some degree, but you don't want that to become the, the pattern. But isn't there a difference between uh, procedural offenses and criminal? offenses. Yeah, well, let's see. I mean, let's, I, it would depend on the offenses. Obviously, some things should not be forgiven. Um, but again, I would probably err a little bit on the side of trying to, you know, in a field of stolen money, they should be prosecuted. But if it's sort of a more political sort of thing, hmm. I would tend to uh, probably to try to just govern the country. Several questions about Trump, quote unquote, sending in the militia in Portland, Chicago, and other cities, democratically led cities, as he has pledged to do. Um, we. First of all, it's about whether the legislators, the federal legislators from those states are going to stand up and say anything about that. And does this turn on its head the notion of state power and states' rights? Because you had Eisenhower sending the National Guard into Arkansas to enforce um, school integration in the 50s, ditto throughout the 50s and 60s. Is this an invert of that? And is Trump acting legally and with the support of Republicans in doing this? I guess the law is ambiguous and they can construct something that makes it at least not obviously illegal, I suppose. But yeah, it's very bad. I mean, to really, and also I think it's no accident that it's, DA, that it's the, the different agencies that were kind of cobbled together 20 years ago into the Department of Homeland Security. The military has very, you know, for all the problems of Lafayette Square, which were real, it was, even that wasn't mostly the military. They have pretty strict rules. The National Guard knows, you know, has told over and over again what they can and can't do. Uh, we have very strong traditions in the military not patrolling the streets of U.S. cities, except in true emergencies where they might come in, as in the L.A. riots in 92 or something, with the cooperation of the governor and the mayor and try to just secure peace. Um, so it's no accident that it's these less well-disciplined parts of the government that have been very politicized, they have very political unions, they're pro-Trump, the Border Patrol, and some of these other parts of, uh, of DHS. And, it's, and it turns out that the military has strong traditions, just as well, the FBI, you're not gonna see FBI agents doing the kind of stuff that we saw in the streets of Portland. But, but without FBI. insignia, it all looks like the federal government to the people. Yeah, no, it's very that bad. that tarnishes I everything. Saw the, Esper, the Secretary of Defense said, you know, they really shouldn't look like military people. I do think, I mean, this is where if you had a, decent Republican Party in the Senate, they would join with the Democrats in the House and say, we've got a problem. We cannot just have the president and some acting secretary of HHS who's totally unqualified for the job and wasn't confirmed to be secretary and a whole bunch of other acting people sort of deploying these different parts of the 
of the of the Department of Homeland Security, which each have their mission. Border Patrol has its mission, ICE has its mission, you know, the Federal Protective Service has its mission, it protects federal buildings. They're not supposed to be sort of randomly sent into cities that whose mayors Trump doesn't like or whose mayors are of the other party. I mean, I was in the first push right as the idea that you would even say the word democratic mayors. If there's civil unrest and you really need to use federal forces or this Katrina type problems, uh, you know, humanitarian crises, you need to use federal forces then you're very careful to do it by the book. You're very careful not to be political. You don't attack the mayor of the city or you're sending the troops into and so forth. I mean, it's so third world like for Trump to do it this well, way. I think people are right to really look at Portland and kind of shudder. Well, that and you describe the way it's supposed to be. But again, where are the barriers? The people who are supposed to be standing up, where are the Hugh Scotts and Barry Goldwaters who went over to Richard Nixon to tell him it was all over? Yeah, they're not, and, they're not there. And the fear they're that talking. they all seem to have of Donald Trump, who will stand up to this man and say, you cannot do that? Yeah, I think the voters on November 3rd, I mean, it is lucky we have a federal system and the governor of Oregon and the mayor of Portland and probably can limit the damage that could be done. Uh, but I agree. I mean, when Trump said, the, was it just yesterday, I start to keep track of time and Trump, you know, the Trump year, I might just send these troops to Detroit and Chicago and all these places. The idea that Republicans from those states said, wait a second, if the governor requests them, that's one thing. If there's a particular emergency that requires, you know, the Border Patrol for some reason to be, you know, 500 of them to be somewhere, that's another thing. But you can't just say randomly send them into cities you don't like or because the, you know, you read, you see on Fox News that there was some incident somewhere or some, some monument was torn down. So I, I agree. It is, this again comes back to, yeah, the shocking collapse of congressional oversight and really of the Republican Party's oversight and willingness to stand up to Trump. Lana has a question about how, and this is how deeply Trump is getting into dismantling the operations of government. The post office, which is older than the Republic, he's threatened to do away with partly because um, Jeff Bezos uses the post office to send Amazon items out there. Uh, surely <laughs> Republicans who used to stand up to defend funding for NPR because that was the only radio that they got in some parts of their states, surely Republicans are going to say, you can't dismantle the post office. Well, we'll see what, the, I think they will probably say that ultimately in the bill that we're about to get negotiated on the Hill. Trump also, I think, sees it as a way of messing up the vote by mail and absentee voting efforts for November. Um, again, I mean, a lot of these people, I guess, if you want to be nice, which I don't particularly, but if you want to be nice to the Republicans in the Senate or the House, you could say, I mean, some of them are just on board with Trump, period. And they don't have any attachment to 200-year-old traditions. They don't have any attachment to democratic norms, honestly. They're on board with Trump. That's their, that they believe it, I suppose you could say, or, or whatever. It's their ticket to fame and glory, and that's that. The decent ones, I think there has been a little bit of a, like, they almost can't believe what's happening, but you think they might have snapped out of that by now after impeachment and so forth. And again, I, it was sort of what you said a few minutes ago, that you, have they, would they have snapped out three months later, or why aren't they snapping out of it now? There's sort of a kind of fatalism. So A, I mean, their base doesn't want them to, and B, there's a kind of fatalism. Well, we'll just make it to the election. I've heard that an awful lot when I run into Republicans. You know, will you speak out against Trump? Will you just, just say you won't vote for him for president in 2020? That would be a big deal. So if it's like ignoring the lifeboats. If 10 Republican senators who are retiring, half of them, right, a lot of them, in the next two, four, six years, or who are in safe seats. Just say, you know what, I'm not telling anyone else what to do, and that people of good conscience can differ on this. I personally will not vote for Donald Trump for re-election. That would be, make a big difference, I think. Why that can't would, they do that? But they will, but it's pathetic that they won't do that. And why not? I don't even know why not, really, you know? Um, Cheryl and Brian want to know how we change the term defunding to police to something like reforming the police, because that, for the Democrats, is an Achilles heel. Donald Trump has imputed that phrase and that policy to Joe Biden, which of course he does not embrace, but it's something that they're using to try to stick on to Democrats with defund the police. And it can be very effective, like the, the 3 a.m. phone call ad that they have put out there of some woman who can't get the police when her yeah. house is being broken into. I mean, again, I think it's, uh, it's the irony is that Joe Biden was attacking the Democratic primary for the crime bill of 1994, which bolstered uh, police, I think, added 100,000 cops to the streets, and often now is regarded as having gone too far in that direction, too much military uh, type equipment for the cops, for the police, and so forth. So uh, Biden's a good person to say, and he has said from the beginning, that's ridiculous, I'm not for defunding the police. He actually has support of police organizations who he's worked with for years when he was Senate Judiciary Chairman and so forth. So I... I think it's not quite, it turns out it's not quite as easy to 
you can convince your base of a lot, apparently. If, if there's some chunk of the country, unfortunately, this is partly a social media thing, partly a Fox News thing, partly a whatever thing, but, you know, that wants to believe the worst about everything that everyone they don't like and is just will believe anything that Trump tells them, basically, and that's unfortunate. Turns out there are an awful lot of voters, though, who just can't be quite bamboozled in that way. It's been interesting that he tried to play those cards, and I don't think they've really worked so far. Um, so I don't think people look at Joe Biden, or they don't look at Governor Governor Newsom or Governor you know, Whitmer in Michigan, and sort of pretty mainstream Democratic governors, honestly, or pretty moderate Democratic mayors, you know, as in LA. They don't think well; those, they may think they're a little too liberal on this issue or that. But they don't, and some of them are, from my point of view, incidentally, and some of them have made some mistakes. I'd say up in San Francisco in terms of just you know keeping the city safe and and sort of clean and all that. But but again, those are reasonable policy differences. Uh, but I don't think voters look at uh, those Democrats and think, well, those people are just crazed uh, anarchists who, who literally don't want there to be a police force. And I would say the pandemic mismanagement has totally undercut that message. That is, Nixon in 68 ran on a law and order platform, and it, there were elements underneath it of race and so forth. But Nixon was, had been vice president for eight years. He was regarded as a very, you know, sort of solid, if not very in attractive always, you know, likable politician, was, you know, he would kind of restore order. Trump, after the behavior of the last several months, it's very hard to look at Trump and say, you know what, he's going to really restore order. Trump is part of the problem now for about 60% of Americans, not part of the solution. Uh, the, um, um, there's a lot of questions along these lines. Larry says, one of my good friends, someone he says you know fairly well, argues that the threat to liberal democracy from the far left is greater than the threat from Trump or Trumpism, but he can't support Biden because Biden will be beholden to the left wing and it's neo-Marxist critical theory advocates and anti-Zionists, if not outright anti-Semites. This is going to be a subtext that's also played out along with the defund the police. It all, seems all a package. So how would you dismantle an argument like that and give some counter to it? I mean, I would acknowledge maybe a little more than some Democrats would that there are liberal elements on the left. There are anti-Israel elements in the Democratic Party. Uh, there has been maybe too much tolerance on the left for certain kinds of woke attacks on free speech on campus and stuff. But Joe Biden is not that way. And it, it, they're not going to dominate the Biden administration. And I will disagree probably with something, many things the Biden administration does, including in foreign policy, maybe on Israel, for example. But I don't think it, he's going to be fundamentally anti-Israel and certainly not anti-Semitic. And we know, you know, let's see who his running mate is. And but, you know, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, I, this is where I think the Democrat, one of the problems we have is we have a bunch of people who are 75 years old running the country and we sort of need to make a generational turnover. Honestly, though, for this one election in 2020, it's probably lucky that, the, that it's Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer and, and, and uh, people like that. You don't look at those people and think, oh, my God, they're just going to, you know, Chuck Schumer is going to destroy Wall Street. Nancy Pelosi is going to destroy uh, Silicon Valley. I don't really think so, that they're, they're going, they, they spend all their time thinking about how to weaken the state of Israel. That's not their history. <laughs> now, are there elements in the party that will be pushing, pushing, pushing? Am I confident that four or eight years from now, those elements won't be stronger? No but then they should get in and fight that fight. But Trump is making the worst element stronger. That's what I would say to the person who asked the question. If you, don't, if you want more tolerance on campus, if you want moderate liberals to be pro-Israel, if you want a, a kind of a revival of an attachment to America and American institutions, the worst thing for that is Trump. Trump has done such a damage to those because he contaminates and sort of everything he touches. And so it's become harder for moderates and responsible liberals to make the case they want to make in these areas because Trump is so demagogic on the one side that he then leads to demagogy on the other side and the people in the middle get, get, get drowned out. Mindful of that, who do you think, as a, someone who's going to vote for Joe Biden, who do you think the best candidate for vice president will be then to try to bring in as many Republicans as possible without alienating uh, voters on the left will say, oh, no, I'm just going to stay home. I'm not going for that. Well, the Biden campaign is, is testing, working on this and pulling on it and testing it and focus grouping it constantly. And I, I don't know. I mean, I think Elizabeth, I just have the kind of normal view from a center-right person. I think Elizabeth Warren is would raise more hackles than you need to raise. Uh, if you wants to pursue some of her economic policies, 
as president, that's fine, but I just think put her on the ticket would, would be an easy talking point for Trump, that you know, your taxes are gonna go skyrocketing, and if you were in the finance, any part of the financial services industry, you're finished and so forth. So I don't think you need that, so to speak. Um, but I think there are, there are responsible governors and senators and former cabinet officials. I, I would go cautious and kind of conservative with a little C, Biden's ahead. You know, someone like Janet Napolitano, even, who's out of office, but was a cabinet secretary, a governor. And head of the University of California. President of the university. You know, she has no ambitions. I mean, I almost might almost at this point think you, you go for sort of a message of, look, we're going to run this country for four or maybe eight years, if health permits, in a responsible way. We can have litigate the issue of the future of the Democratic Party and which 42-year-old progressive you like better or, or not so progressive. That could be litigated four or eight years from now. We're an emergency. We need people who can seriously govern. Let's try to squeeze in two more. One of them is whether the debates are going to be dispositive or whether they're even going to happen. I think the, I think at least two, a couple will probably happen, maybe not all three. You know, a huge mistake in a debate can make a difference. But I think actually the summer is very important. History suggests that if on, people make up their minds now, they're kind of maybe I'll switch from last time, maybe I won't, should I? Often by Labor Day, they've kind of finished that process. And a lot of, the, for all the drama, and you and I have seen it so many times, so September and October, it doesn't change that many votes usually. Uh, and I guess we can wrap up with this before I give you a, a few minutes, a few minutes for the last word, and that if Biden is elected and we survive this interregnum without all manner of, of executive orders and pardons being issued, then what happens with Republicans? Are they going to say, nope, we're not going to let another Democratic president do anything again? Is it just enough to get Trump out of there? Or are Republicans really going to cooperate to try to rebuild things and put guardrails in place and regulations that will affect presidents from both parties? So I think some maybe will. And if I were Biden, I'd try very hard to reach out. And Biden's been in the Senate forever, so he, he would know who to reach out to get some Republican votes for some of these things, you know, the new legal strictures for DHS, for example. I just think it would make a big difference for the country if these things pass with 65 votes instead of 51 votes. Um, but a lot of Republicans aren't gonna be cooperative. A lot of them are gonna think the way to go is to be just oppositional and to be bitter and to be Trumpy and to be, uh, say, you know, just attack everything. I, but I think you just need to split the party, honestly. Biden, the whole party's mm -hmm. not gonna be great. But you know, there are responsible governors. If I were Biden, I'd go out of my way to work with Larry Hogan and with Charlie Baker and even with others you don't like so much, but you know, governors want their states to do well. Mike DeWine in Ohio, uh, maybe even people who I've been disappointed with in the last few months, Governor Ducey in Arizona, but you know, he's he's shown at other times that he's able, wants yeah. to govern. And again, it changes. If Biden's president, if the Democrats control the Senate, suddenly the Republicans think, gee, I can't just, you know, if you're a actually in office, do you just want to be screaming and yelling? So I think it will, it will be an interesting challenge for, the, for Biden to help make it easier for more Republicans to be responsible. But I wouldn't bet on a majority of them, unfortunately. Uh, Bill, can you give us a 30 second wrap up of how, how, how the next 100 days look to you? I, I think Biden's likely to win, and I don't think they'll be, I think, you know, God knows they could be surprises. I am worried about real, you know, dirty tricks of many, many kinds by Trump. I would just say this, since I've been sort of maybe a little downbeat, I do think it's also a moment for fresh thinking and an opportunity. I mean, we've seen our institutions tested. If we come through this, we can take some pride that we will have come through it pretty well, I think. And then it's a question of building them much more stronger and more to be more effective in the 21st century. So in a way, especially for young people, I think, it's a depressing moment to come into politics. I spoke at a college a couple of uh, year ago and it was like, gee, I'm 21, I love politics. And now I look at these situations, do I want to get involved? But in a way, it's a great opportunity to take the country back from this cliff and to build uh, in, a, in a new way and in a stronger way to rebuild these institutions. In a way to feel empowered. Bill Crystal, thank you so much. Of course, you can follow Bill on Twitter and you can read his work online and at the Bulwark as well. So I wanna thank everyone for coming this time. Next time, it's uh, Warren Olney with Tom Friedman. You don't wanna miss that. And of course, thanks as always to Janice and David for sponsoring this program, to all of you for listening and attending. I hope it's been enlightening for you. I know it has for me. Thank you.